Um, hi, everyone. It's good to see you. I know that there are a few people who could not make it, and this is actually our last session with this topic. Um, I wanted to actually thank you for being here so many weeks and also tell you about the coming weeks. So next week, I will not be here. Uh, I'll be in the area, but I'm going to be at Beth L. Congregation watching my colleague, Rabbi Jay Kornsgold, be installed as president of the Rabbinical Assembly, which is the International Association of Conservative Masorti Rabbis. Um, and he's a friend since I'm 14 years old. So I'd be happy to be there. The week after, I'm going to be teaching online. And the teaching will be texts about Pesach and thinking about Pesach and about freedom in this particular year. I plan to talk about one particular verse in the Haggadah that is very painful. Pour out your wrath on the non-Jews or those who do not those who do not know you. And then about some alternatives to it and then other pieces of the Seder. That is on the 26th. So not next week, but in two weeks on Zoom, same bat channel, same bat time. On the 2nd of April, I will not be here. I will be in Tel Aviv. So um, yeah, the week after, April 9th, please mark your calendars to come to the Jewish Center. This will all be emailed out to come to the Jewish Center. It is Rosh Chodesh Nisan. And Eleni and I will be teaching a class together about Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Part of it will be text study and part of it will be art. You do not need to be an artist to do it. The last class is the, third, the 16th. It is a week before Pesach. We are planning, and I will send stuff out about it and talk about it in this week's email, a Seder slam. You want to know what a slam is? So in the last two years, I've brought to the Jewish Center pre-Pesach my favorite wines for you to try and my best suggestions for running a great Seder. At our Pesach slam, what I'm asking of all of you is for you and anyone in the congregation to bring your ideas for running a great Seder. I'll bring mine. And also your favorite recipes that you would share with each other. Something that is unusual, something that is not maybe made in someone else's house. So that's the next few, four weeks or so. Next week, I will not be here. The 26th, Pesach online text study. The second, I will not be here. I'll be in Tel Aviv. Um, the ninth will be at the Jewish Center, although we will have a Zoom option if you really need it, but it's really an art class, so we'd really love you there in person. Um, and actually, that's going to be at 8 o'clock, from 8 to 9. And then on the 16th, at 7 o'clock at the Jewish Center. Okay. Um, now we're going to continue. I have one other advertisement, which is um, this curriculum was brought to you by the Hartman the Shalom Hartman Center in Jerusalem. They also have a North American branch. Um, I've been going for about nine summers in the summertime for a 12 day learning for rabbis from around the country, around the world actually. Um, Rabbi Annie Lewis goes and other people that you probably know. Uh, what I love about it is there's incredible scholarship and that the rabbis who attend are reform, reconstructionist, conservative, and orthodox. Last summer, my chavruta for a couple of days was a black hat orthodox man. It just, it's kind of this wonderful coming together. The Hartman Institute also runs the same sort of mm -hmm. learning for you, for lay people. If you're interested, please let me know. Last year, Alexandra Bar Cohen went. It's one week in Jerusalem. This year, she's going again, and there are a few other friends of hers from the Jewish Center who are considering going. 
Um, it's just an incredible opportunity to learn. I believe it's on the 26th of June till the 3rd of July. And I'm happy to send you all the information about it and speak with you about what it's like. This is Alexandra. And I'm planning also to go and be there for their last few days of study. Okay, I have a question to start. And then I'm gonna play a song for you. I'm gonna have you listen to the song. It's about four minutes. And the song will, is in Hebrew, but fully translated in the video. I'd like you to go around. And what I'd love to hear from you is, where do you feel most at home? And is there another place that you feel at home? Where do you feel? I asked Nancy this today. Where do you feel most at home? And is there another place you feel at home? Anyone want to jump in? Yeah, Suzanne. Um, I at the moment, I guess I feel most at home here in the states and at the Jewish Center. You know, just with um, what's familiar. But um, although I've never been to Israel yet, um, my answer might change at that point. But the other place where I really feel at home is Ireland. So you're going large places. Okay. Uh, play, well, yeah, I, yeah, I thought that, that was what we were, were doing, but I'm, um, I'm going to say, I feel most at home in my parents' apartment in South Jersey, in Margate, New Jersey, because uh, it's the one place left in my life where the whole family was. And I see their things there. And I remember the, um, my mom and dad and all of us being there together for 30 years. So that's where I feel most at home, even though I have my own home here, which the Zoom, what makes Zoom great is we're all in each other's homes. And there are other places I feel at home too, but that's where I feel most at home. Anyone else want to go? Edna. I feel most at home, obviously, in Israel, if you want more specific, in the Negev. And second, I would say that I feel at home in Princeton, which is a, a process that, you know, you grow into, but I definitely feel at home when I come back to Princeton. I feel at home. I mean, you know, when you go out, you come back. Oh, huh, this is a place I love. Ah, so you have two homes. Good. Good to think about. Who else? Debbie, then Ellen. I guess after 32 years of living here, I feel most at home here. Um, but I have no family who live in this area at all. But my left to Chicago, where if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I would have said that was home. Most of my family is gone. Yeah, it's really hard. It's hard. Oh, the older we get, right? Yeah, I mean, the architecture and the buildings and the museums and the attractions, that's all the same and that's all real good in my head. Baseball teams, all of that stuff, but not people. But anymore. Plainsboro and Nancy's backyard opening onto yours. Yes. That's home. Okay. That's right. <laughs> okay. Who else? Ellen. So that's a hard question. I've yeah. been here 30 years and I lived in Atlanta for 14 years, but that's where my children grew up and that's where I made most of my friends. Yeah. So I feel very much at home in, in Princeton. I've made a life here. I am very, my son wants me to move back to Atlanta and I don't want to leave Princeton even though I have children and grandchildren there. But when I fly to Atlanta, as I'm flying in and I see Stone Mountain and the skyline of Atlanta, I feel like I'm going home. Ah, and you lived there last time. Interesting. And I fit there less, but my children grew up yeah, there and my right. closest friends are in Atlanta. You should I make your closest friends. friends when you have children in preschool together. Exactly. Right? But I have wonderful yeah. friends here and I... I, I my son wants me to move back to Atlanta, but I won't do it. Well, tell him that you are indefinitely employed at the Jewish Center because we need a <laughs> master teacher, so you, she, he can't have you. Um, Edna, how many years have you been here? 
since uh, Passover, Pesach of uh, 90. But like uh, Ellen said before, the attachment and the belonging is also because my girls grew up here. That's right. So, yeah. And uh, Israel, for me, it's always home. It's obviously, I don't need to, you know, explain. It's like language, culture, friends, memories, love, first love, second love, third love, whatever. <laughs> the Negev, the beaches, whatever. So, obviously, Israel, it's home. But uh, Princeton, too. Princeton, well, Right, and a lot, your children were raised here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, who else is going to jump in? Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Hello, everyone. So I grew up um, outside of Trenton, in Trenton, then moved to Princeton. So I, uh, most of my uh, time has been spent in this general area. So this certainly feels, in general, like home to me. I would say I don't really have the same kind of experience as others have talked about for the second. And I, but I do remember going to Israel. I'm not sure if this would be repeated, but when I went to Israel many years ago, I just had a really strong sense that, you know, I was home on some level. Yeah. It was very strong. Yeah, the um in Jewish history since forever, the way Judaism <coughs> constructed itself was so that you would feel that. So that all the years of the diaspora before 1948 was about yearn yearning. And all the years after Egypt after leaving Egypt, was walking towards Israel. And um, so you were, that was embedded in the Jewish education that you were, that you got from wherever. Yeah. There's a, there used to be a museum in Israel called Beit HaTfutzot. It no longer exists. Beit HaTfutzot means is the diaspora museum. And at the end of the Diaspora Museum, I'm sure some of you have been there, there was a very large quote on the wall. It said, makom sh'ani holech, kama, ani holech Eretz Yisrael. Mm. Every place where I go, I am going towards the land of Israel. Mm. Okay? That museum, by the way, no longer exists because it was changed into a different Anu. museum, yeah. right? Called the Anu Museum which reflects a change in the relationship between how the Jews of Israel saw the Jews outside of Israel. It used to be, this was about the diaspora, everyone who lived outside of Israel, and now it's about Jewish peoplehood. So interesting, which is what this these lectures have been about. Okay, anyone else on home? Where do you find home for you? Where, or do you have two of them? Nance? Well, I, I would say at this point, this is my home. This area, my house, my town, my synagogue, my community. There's no question that this is um, this is my home. And I've spent more time outside of the country. Israel is the place I've spent most of my time. Out of, you know, and and I would say that there are places in Israel that I feel very, very much at home. Uh, when I lived on a kibbutz as a 19-year-old, Ayad Abanyas, uh, Mapal Habanyas, near the Banyas waterfall. Spent a lot of time near that waterfall, and it felt always felt so good. And I went back uh, a couple of years ago, and it still felt really good. And it it's it felt like a a special kind of home. So it felt like special. Okay. But your home is here. Yeah. Anything else um, before we continue? Okay. We're going to listen to a poem. Um, the poem is called, some of you will definitely know the poem. We're going to look at its words after. The poem, um, I felt like really talked about one of the ideas in in this whole, you know, course and 
wasn't given to me by Hartman, but when I told them, oh, I'm going to add this, they're like, yeah, that's right. The poem is called Ilan Ilanot, and it is by Leah Goldberg. Leah Goldberg is a probably the most well, most read Israeli poet. She, I'll give you her full biography later, but she lived in Russia. And she lived around Europe. She got a PhD in 1935. Her family and she moved to then the land of Israel. And she would become one of the more published poets. We're going to play for you a YouTube of her poem, Eid La Note. How many of you, I mean, besides Edna, how many of you know, know it? Okay. So this poem was taken maybe 30 years ago by an American Israeli named Noah. Oh, then, then her name wasn't Noah. Then it was Achinoam Nini, mm -hmm. but she goes by Noah. And this is a YouTube. I want you to pay close attention to the words that she was writing, that that Achinoam Nini, that, that, that Leah Goldberg wrote. Those are the Hebrew words. The English words are the words that um, Noah added. And it's four minutes, it's worth listening to, and it's so beautiful. Jot down anything that you feel. We're going to have the words in front of us afterwards. And we're going to play the YouTube. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm sure the song some of you will play, and it'll be so familiar and beautiful. And But you're going to have to watch because the words are going to be, unless you understand Hebrew. Oh, my. 
Thank you. So we're gonna um, read some of the words of the poem together. Uh, but before that, I'll just leave it open for your thoughts on how the song made you feel or if anything stuck out to you before we pull the words up. You like it, you didn't like it. Debbie. It expresses how my father felt about Israel. My father was, you know, before World War II involved in smuggling Polish Jews to Palestine at the time. Um, but my relatives who all ended up there my, on my father's side, they, I mean, it was just, it, it just didn't feel the same to me. They didn't keep in touch. I didn't have that personal connection. I wish I could have, but they didn't do anything to maintain it, even though my father helped support them for decades. And I guess it's the part of it is a, a little bit bitter. That that wasn't maintained. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? How the song made you feel or what you think about it? Um, I, if I, if I might. Melissa, um, sure. Yeah. So um, she, I, I like the way she described the yearning and the remembrance of, of where she had come from and it, sort of the, the understanding that you can be in two places at once. Um, but that she wished she could be. And it kind of reminded me of John Denver's um, Take Me Home Country Road. Mm. Um, and, and I think we can all experience that where you want to be, you are in one place and you want to be in another for memories or, right? So I, I, I thought she did it really beautifully. Leah, yeah. Song. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Edna. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah. Okay, it evoked many, many feelings. First of all, I thought that I love the voice of Achinoam Nuni. So, Nini. No, yeah, so she's always bring kind of a feeling of, uh, I don't know if romanticism or nostalgic or something yeah. calming or very emotional, poetic. But going back to Leah Goldberg, by the way, it's interesting that you chose her because uh, I don't know how many... Okay, I'll go back to the movie. Uh, it no, was, no, say the Leah Goldberg, and then we're yeah, going to study her. Yeah, because I don't know how many people know that she was never married. She was single. Uh, she lived in Tel Aviv. Uh, and she was also, and this takes us back to the topic. That's why I, th I, I, I was thinking, wow, interesting you choose Leah Goldberg, because she also was a very good, I would say almost professional, a translator. She translated many, many, many uh, classical yeah. works the Odyssey. Classical, yep. uh, for children. And this takes me back. And she wrote also amazing children books that I read to um, Ben and Gal, obviously, because they are classic. And she wrote many, many, many kids songs that are amazing. But going back to the song uh, that you chose, Ilanot, uh, I was thinking suddenly you brought me back to the days that I was a teacher of Israeli literature in Israel because at Lea Goldberg or in most of her songs, you see the motifs of the snow, of the bells, of the feeling of the church, uh, winter time, uh, things that nature-wise are not have. Israeli typical landscaping. So yeah. unlike many other poets, she doesn't necessarily write about the local landscaping. And there right. is a lot of earning and missing and longing to other um, other setting, okay? Yes. So um, that takes me also, because you took me back to <laughs> many years ago that she herself, if I, I don't remember her words, but in her own diary, she writes that as much as along all her life, 
she missed Russia and she missed Germany and yep. she missed Europe, she feels as a whole, but really as a whole in Israel, and this is mainly because of the Hebrew and the language and the people and the deeds, activities she did, and she's not necessarily writes this big patriotic local songs. So... And I yet think, her poetry, as you yet, know, is studied, probably one of the most prolific, right? She's studied of, a lot. Of course, because yeah. that it will take me also to maybe more, it's not personal, it's a universal comment. I always remember talking, you talk about Passover, that my mom before Passover will bring home chocolate eggs. And I would always ask her, what is the connection? It's okay, it's like a beta, it's like an egg, but as a matter of fact, because she grew up as a child in Europe, in Romania, for her it was memory. When yeah. she came, Nancy probably remember her coming to Adi and Liron Bat Mitzvah. So when she saw the fall here, she was like walking in seven seven in yeah. the clouds. So you see it also with Lea Goldberg. Yeah. That her sentiments take her to, to places that are not obviously the Midbar or Yam Amelach or Kineret or Agolan or Jerusalem even. Even yeah. the, the clock of the Kukia, right? Yeah. So, uh, so there is a lot to say about it, but I thought that it's a very, very uh, enriching choice by you. <laughs> Thank you. So I want to bring the words up and just spend a little bit of time on them and, and tell you why I brought it. Well, I think it's apparent why I brought it. So um, Ahi Noam Nini, or as she goes by now, Noah, uh, grew up in the United States, but was Israeli as well. She went to high school in New York at uh, Ramaz, which is a modern Orthodox yeshiva. That's a good one. And um, her, when I first learned the song, I got to tell you, years ago, I didn't know that it was Leia Goldberg, right? I just was learning this beautiful song and the snow-capped mountains and the kukia, the blue jay, which is a blue jay, and the pine trees. For me, that was the United States. And later when I learned, I'm like, oh, she superimposed her own, Noah superimposed her own experience in the English stanza. And the Hebrew stanzas were Leah Goldberg's. Uh, Suzanne, can you bring up the words? It was the second email with just the words. I only got the one. I'm sorry. Let me check. Really? Hold on. Do you know the song game? So this is hers too. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Not a, let me see. But you, you can do it as a co-host. No, you know what? I Because it was at my computer at the synagogue and it didn't go. I was having internet. Remember I said I was having internet trouble all day at yes. the synagogue? Yes, yes. So um, I just need to pull the words up. Hold on a second. I can send it to Suzanne, to your, but where, to the text or email? Does it matter? Um, email is good. Suzanne.estrament at Hebrew gmail. Translate? Yeah, I, have, I have yours here. From Ilan Noet? Yes. Okay, thank you. Oh. I sent it. Okay, I'll let you know, well, as soon as I get it. Okay, as we're going, I'm gonna, I'll jump into something else and then we'll go back to this. The whole last 14 sessions, we've been thinking about ideas of what is the relationship between, and maybe we'll get to the words back, maybe not, we'll say, thank you, Anna, between North American Jewry and Israeli Jewry, because, maybe since even the late 90s, the relationship between American Jewry and Israeli Jewry has changed and I would say matured at the very beginning of the state and in the foundation of the state. I think we all could say that like, who was it? Debbie's father, it was about 
building, helping Jews after the Shoah to build the state, to build a home, to build a miklat even before. And any of us who are Americans here have, I, I think you do, I have memories of like an uncle and and grandparents, people talking about family members that would like smuggle munitions, that would try to do whatever they could to help build the state because it should never happen again what had happened in the middle of the last century. But what we know is that all of the Jewish people's life has been about journeying. How many of you, did Did any of you, I think it would be Edna usually does, did any of you see the lecture by Yehuda for this class? Okay, so I'm gonna summarize a little bit of it. I apologize to Edna, the one who did watch no, it. It's okay, it's okay. It's always learning new aspects. <laughs> okay, so Judaism has always been stories about journeying. First, we journey to Egypt, then we journey to the promised land. The biblical narrative is about exile and then about going back after the first exile. And after the first exile, what do we know? We know that not everyone goes back. A large group of people stay. They stay. They stay in Babylonia. They stay in Egypt. And they create a diaspora community. And then after the second destruction of the second temple, the second commonwealth in 70 of the common era, most people leave. Some stay, but most people leave. And so our entire stories as a people are about journeying. I even can look over at my uh, Bubby's Samovar yeah. from Eastern Europe that's sitting on my counter, that it has stamps from every country she went through to get here. And all of our lives, you know, we, we say that plant is called the wandering Jew because Jews wander. They wander throughout and they not just wander, but they journey. So our, the, let, the 20th century found us um, at a time where we built in the United States, our grandparents and our parents built a sense of at-homeness that maybe Jews haven't felt anywhere, maybe. And Jews in Israel, since they started in the 1880s, the Zionist Congresses, built a sense of at-homeness in Israel, in modern Israel, that hasn't been, you know, since, I don't know when, maybe never. Uh, because what we know about the first and second Jewish commonwealths is that for very little of that time did the Jewish people actually have sovereignty over ourselves. A lot of the time we were either fighting or there was someone ruling over us. So what the Hartman folks and what Yehuda has said is many North American Jews have a hard time talking about their sense and owning their sense of at-homeness. And many North American Jews instinctively fear that other diaspora Jews felt similarly about their at-homeness, only to have it quickly taken away with the rise of persecution. Jews in Europe felt at home in Europe until they didn't, until 1933, and the rise of a fascist power that we're not going to talk about. His name should be erased. So can we say that we really have a sense of at-homeness here? And once we do have that sense of at-homeness, what does that mean for us as an owner of this place called the United States? And what does it mean for our Judaism? I'm going to not take questions for, I'm going to just write them down and we'll take it after the more accountable we are to this place, the United States, means that we also have power and privilege. I think that many of us have lived in a time where Jews and many of you here have both power and privilege. And so we struggle 
with a lot of ideas. Are we fully, here are the ideas we struggle. Are we fully at home as Jew? You could be fully at home in the United States, but not be fully at home as a Jew. Are, but questions, are you fully at home as a Jew in the United States? And if so, how do we turn our at-homeness into something that brings us the ability to help others, a sense of really being at home, a sense of Jews choosing to stay here because every one of us here has chosen to not make our home there. It was a hard concept for me to, um, I grew up in a Zionist youth movement in the Young Judea. And when I, I finally realized, oh, I, I live here in America, even though there are places there in Israel that I feel really at home. I go to Kibbutz Keturah, I feel at home. I go in Jerusalem, I feel really at home. But I've chosen to live here. How does my choosing to live here mean that I can create a relationship with Israeli Jews? By the way, Israelis will have their own issue. How do we have bridge builders people who can build bridges between Israeli Jews and American Jews. I think it's so critical for American Jewish communities to be able to welcome Israeli Jews into our communities and to have Israeli Jews say, I want to be part of the community so that we can learn about the Israeli Jewish community and maybe influence it or not, but also to give Israeli Jews a Jewish community. Off topic, Edna and I have had this conversation off topic that so that one of the things I admire about the Israelis who are members of the Jewish Center is that they chose to join or an organized Jewish community. Many Israelis of Edna's generation chose not to. And many of them feel bad about it now, generation, you know, two generations later. Because in the end, wherever we live, we got to feel at home, right? We have to have a way of feeling at home. And then we have to be able to build a narrative of shared belonging. How can I as a Jew or you as a Jew feel totally at home in America and also at home there? How can Jews, Israeli Jews, feel totally at home in Israel and feel that sense of being protected, which by the way, has changed for them radically after October 7th? a feeling that they would never be attacked, that they would always be safe. How can we create a time, a sense in the world where there is mutual th thriving in two homes? And we have that, you know, we do have that. How do we feel a sense of at-homeness? And how do we not waste this moment in Jewish history? The great moment where we both have sovereignty over our own land as Jews and can run a government with all of its difficulties, while at the same time having a strong Jewish community in the diaspora that is living and evolving. And then for Israelis, how can they also feel a sense of connectedness to the diaspora Jewish community. Uh, at the, I think two lectures ago, when Tehila Friedman was talking about American feminism and how American feminism influenced her Orthodox Jewish feminism in Israel, at 20 years ago, an Israeli wouldn't be able to say that. If it came, if it was Jewish and it came from the diaspora, it was traif, it was off limits. Now, not so. Now, if it's Jewish and comes from the diaspora, we can be together, can learn from each other. Can we have a metaphor for Israeli Jews living in Israel and American Jews living in America, but still being part of the same great family? How do we live in a home that is different, but where we have like a family? Mutual, mutual connections to each other. Throughout Jewish history, Jews have always struggled with the tension of being together and apart, right? We have lots of different times and, right? We have Jews who are Sephardic and Jews who are Ashkenazi and Jews who are Mizrahi. We know that we are not all the same. 
how can North American and Israeli Jews not have hierarchy, but one community being better or worse at some things? How can we be both together on some things and apart? I'm going to stop and invite you to talk about any of those questions, then show, uh, then then bring up the Ela note uh, poem, and then maybe if we have time, listen to 20 minutes of Danielle Hartman in an interview with Yehuda Kurtzler and Tal Becker. Tal Becker is um, someone from Hartman, but who is actually one of the folks that serves the Israeli government as a negotiator in most of the peace deals in the last 30 years. So anyone want to say anything about this concept of together and apart and of having two homes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ju Judy, then Edna, and then whoever else goes. Um, the thought that keeps going through my mind is uh, with everything you're saying and with listening to the song is how ironic that you started teaching this, you know, three or four days after October 7th. And what would this have looked like? Um, which, means, which means, Judy, I planned to teach, to teach it in July. Yeah, that's interesting. I chose it's, this in July. Yeah, yeah. And it's just- I chose it and bought the course in July. Right, okay. So like how different would this whole course have looked and felt um, if there hadn't been October the 7th? And, you know, not only with what happened in Israel, but the extraordinary surge in Jew hatred in this country. Oh, well, that's right. That's and right, all, you still feel at home. Right. But all of a sudden, it's a whole lot scarier than it ever was in the, you know, first 75 years of my life. And I'm not really sure where it's going. It seems to be getting worse, not better um, with each passing day. And um, so I don't know. It's it's I just keep thinking about that. And um, it's a little harder to frame this. I know this was chosen before October 7th. So it's as I'm hearing the words that you're saying, I'm trying to imagine it from July. Right, we, we can't go back to July, but what we can remember about July is the reason I chose this. By the way, Suzanne, I just sent you a translation of what Edna just sent um, for later. Yeah, so in July, if you remember, I was we were all sitting, tearing our hair out because we, some of you may have loved the Israeli government. Many of you did not love the Israeli government. Um, I was in, you know, during my Hartman classes, leaving class early with my professors, with Yossi Klein Alevi to go march against mm -hmm. the judicial reforms of the Netanyahu government at the in front of the Knesset. I remember we walked from Hartman to the, Knesset with thousands of other people because we so much cared about the future of the state of Israel and how it looked and how it behaved. And by the way, so many of you feel that now during this war, I've spoken to almost everyone on this Zoom privately about how pained you are in so many ways right? You're pained that there are hostages. You're pained that Israel was attacked. You're pained that it seems like a really hard way to go to war when so many innocent or folks in Gaza are being killed, that Hamas is hiding amongst uh, civilians, that it doesn't seem like there's an end. Yeah, you're all in a lot of pain. And as am I, yeah. And <laughs> and we're in pain because we care, we're connected. Yes, Judy, if only we could go back to the days of disliking the government and not the days of hostages and 
people on both sides dying and and the anti-Semitism. I mean, a year ago, no, none of you could imagine this, right? Michelle, you could? <laughs> I'm looking at you. I don't think not, not, not as extreme as this. No. Yeah. yeah. You couldn't imagine the pogrom itself, the way it was done. You might imagine a conflict, right? You might. War, but not a terror pogrom. So you might right. You couldn't imagine an ongoing terror program, and then what it made us have to do, right? So us meaning, and I say us, us meaning, I'm not Israeli, and I say us meaning the Jewish people. I wake up. I'm sure all of you do too. Like every day, I'm checking my phone for my my friends and their kids. Are they in Gaza or out? Where are they? Are they in the north or are they not? What's the count? We're we're all, we're all in, in in pain over it. And also, I'm sure so many of you are in pain. Like when I look at the pictures from Gaza and I see the pictures of all the tunnels, and I think about how that money could have been spent building schools or. Palestinian community centers or pools or I don't know. Or a real economy that could thrive. Which well, have I think you did. might remember that in 2005, when the Israelis left, Israel left factories and, and farms and, and farms, in the, especially in the north. Right. It's so, true. yeah. Uh, do you feel like less? And 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 first, I want. I'm I'm so appreciative. Of anyone who would like to talk, I would love to. Anyone who hasn't spoken yet, what it do you feel like as an American Jew? You feel a sense of we can have two homes, or that the Jewish people can have multiple homes. Uh, Bob, did you want to say something? Yeah, I've been sort of quiet, you know, because, well, thank you. As my dog's making a comment, they, they, they're going to comment instead of me. Um, I think the important, uh, the mark of intelligence is to have cognitive dissonance and to be able to hold two completing thoughts. So I'm listening to the love of, of Israel and the sense of home. And I've had it, actually. I've been there twice for long visits, and I've really had a sense of home. Um, I can go on, but I won't. Um, at the same time, it's really at the same time, you have to remember that the, the leaders of the, the Arab leaders in 1848, there was no Palestinian polity at the time, but the Arab leaders in the Mufti of Jerusalem said no, no Jewish homeland in Palestine. And the people who were, who were victims were the people, were the Palestinians. Because although many people objected to Ben-Gurion saying, well, we'll accept it. And even though there are many uh, Arabs here, when the Jews arrive, we will have a Jewish homeland. Well, that, the bets were off. But the point that I feel, of course, is that the people who experienced the Nakba did not make that decision. They were just pushed out. And the stories are as grim as you say. The cognitive dissonance is that you, as listening and feeling the sense of hatikva, there's also a sense of the nakba, and it's okay to have both feelings, which I do, and that extends to everything here. Now, I was at a conf conference, I don't know, I didn't recognize the people here, but Norman Finkelstein, I think the name should ring bells with everybody here, as he's a Holocaust survivor's daughter, a son who is a Palestinian apologist for the worst things came and spoke at Princeton. And he said in his speech, I am not going to get angry. I'm not going to get angry. So when I spoke and I, I, I got a chance to ask him a comment, I said, um, you know, I'm re really glad you're speaking on behalf of the Palestinians. It's really important. At the same time, if the government of Hamas, government, not Hamas, I didn't even think of Hamas, the government of Gaza. Fatah then? Uh, huh? About With six years ago. Yeah, so it's Fatah probably, but okay. Yeah, well, it was Hamas, but I'm not thinking Hamas. If the government of Gaza 
brought all that stuff from for war that they used to attack Israel to the border and said, give us the things we need to build a civil society. Within six months, Gaza would stop being an open air prison and being a, a delightful place to live, maybe like I thought up, up, through, up the ocean. Well, he screamed at me for five minutes. And by the time he finished, I was an Israeli tank commander well, taking his mother out of the ghetto to Auschwitz. So his failing isn't speaking for the Palestinians. It's not being able to have a sense that there are two truths here and, and we have to find a way to make the people who have these two truths see both truths and live them. That's my comment. Well, that is certainly what is needed on the ground there. As American Jews living here, we can hear multiple truths. And what will be interesting for all of us moving forward is to learn and hear multiple truths and then figure out how to still accept people we may not agree with, but figure out how to keep them in our family.